Vernon Balloon Experiments, VE7 uh, VBX. So pleased to present uh, sort of our, uh, our lessons learned and, and the fun that we had doing these experiments. Uh, just a little bit about me, as, as uh, Doug mentioned, I did uh, acquire my amateur radio license at the age of 15, and I currently work for Kenwood. But I just thought it was the coolest thing here that uh, way back in 1993, I was in grade 12, uh, going to high school here in PEI, and I managed to work J1YKX. And uh, quite pleased that um, you know about uh, 15 years later, I've actually had a, an opportunity to spend some time in the JA1YKX shack at our uh, communication headquarters uh, in uh, in Japan. So it's amazing sometimes, um, and I, I hope there's some younger folks that uh, have a chance to uh, view this presentation as well. But you just sometimes never know. Uh, where this uh, where this hobby is going to uh, to take you. And for me, I was a fairly young, new to Calgary, and one of the very first pe people I met was Dave E6 GAD that just happened to live across Deerfoot from me. And um, he was doing regular truck runs into the interior of BC. So he was my carrier pigeon for bringing uh, care packages home or from home to me uh, while I was going to school in uh, in Calgary. So again, just sometimes you just never know what uh, what may uh, may uh, transpire. Got involved. We did a lot of fun uh, mountaintop work in uh, in uh, the interior of BC here as well. This is Mount Baldy, just outside of Oliver. I got involved with a number of uh, repeater projects, and then we also had a lot of fun on uh, on local mountaintops here, doing uh, you know VHF UHF uh, HF contesting and and maintaining. I said uh, repeaters uh, on some of the the, the, the nearby hills. But we wanted to try something a little bit different. And uh, there's a gentleman here in the middle, his name is Al Norris, VE7MET. And short for meteorologist, Al was uh, working at the Kelowna Weather Station. And it was a newly opened uh, station just outside of, uh, by the airport. And he commented um, you know, on his access to weather balloons. And, um, and I had taken, advantage of the tour of, of his office and and we got chatting a little bit and uh, he said well you know I might be able to make some balloons available if if, if, uh, if there was a group that would be interested in, uh, in trying some radio experimenting so again this was probably about 96 early 97 when we had this conversation I said well Al let me uh, talk to a good friend of mine in, in uh, Alison Vernon is Michael V7 TFD and we quickly said, you know what, we can do something here. Let's, uh, so we spent a little bit of time on the internet and we thought, you know what, let's, let's launch a, a cross band repeater and uh, see how it, how it would work. And so what we did was we used the uh, UHF uh, simplex frequency of 446 on the input. And then we used 14652 uh, transmit on the output. So again, our goal was to carry a working repeater and, and it actually did work. And we launched it uh, to coincide with the Sky High Ham Fest. It was an annual uh, ham fest that took place up on Silver Star Mountain. So we used that event to, uh, to launch our, uh, our balloon. Excuse me here for a sec. So we did that and then, um, but, and this is probably something I would not recommend doing nowadays, but we very clearly marked on the box who the package belonged to, All right? So we had the VBX-1, the Harmless Transmitter, North Okanagan Radio Amateur Club, put a $50 reward if found, um, all, and like I said, all sorts of other uh, contact information on here as well. Um, just because we didn't know uh, where this package was going to end up. And what we used was very a very simple styrofoam cooler that you would got at the local grocery store. So most people, you know, use it to cool down their six packs of beer. But we found it was the most lightweight uh, container uh, to launch um, our uh, balloon package with. So again, we used um, some basic shielding, some um, some aluminum foil. We wrapped up a, uh, a dedicated receiver, dedicated transmitter. We had a basic repeater controller, uh, some uh, lithium uh, D cell batteries that were lightweight, and we uh, we set out to uh, to launch this this package. This package was uh, four and a half pounds. 
So if you're curious on the weight of it at the time, uh, four and a half pounds. And um, you can see by this picture here um, that we just used for antennas, we just used quarter wave uh, upside down antennas. So one dedicated for VHF, one dedicated for UHF. Of course, we all know uh, how uh, a quarter wave uh, antenna radiates. Uh, typically at about 45 degrees. Usually when they're mounted uh, vertically, they, they radiate up. And they, in this case with the balloon, we had the radiation uh, pointing down. So um, in this shot here, we actually see one of our members at the joint tonight here, Dave E6GAD, um, just as we let the, uh, uh, our styrofoam cooler go um, and we're, we're watching it uh, take off. What we found though with typical uh, weather balloons is uh, the payload lift um, wouldn't uh, allow us to carry our package. Uh, so we actually ended up going with uh, multiple balloons. And um, the, the, uh, with the intent here that, you know, if a balloon was to pop, um, you know, we would hopefully have some lift remaining from the other balloon or two to um, help uh, slow the uh, descend rate back down to earth. We weren't very bright on this first launch because if you think about it, these balloons probably expand to about 16 to 20 feet in diameter. So we figured as these balloons expanded, when one popped, the other two popped. So we had this, probably <laughs> what I expected, this four and a half pound styrofoam cooler to fall out of the, sky at whatever speed it would fall. Um, so we learned uh, from, from uh, for, for future uh, launches, but that's how we, uh, how we set, it, uh, set it up. So we uh, quite pleased at the time because we were able to um, work stations all over Southern British Columbia, Southern Alberta, and also into uh, Northern, uh, Northern US. Uh, as this package was just a cross band repeater, we never did get it back. So it's, we figure it's in, the, it's up in the hills uh, somewhere. Uh, it drifted south. So, you know, could be Southern British Columbia uh, or Northern, uh, Northern United States. So that was our first um, experiment. And uh, we thought it went over quite well. We had a, a great article uh, that was uh, published in the, uh, the Canadian Amateur. And we'll have some references at the end of this presentation that, um, that speaks to this. We did hear a report uh, from a gentleman, um, Lyle, in, in, uh, in Utah, who said he had observed the strongest signal at uh, 30 degrees, placing VBX roughly over Wyoming. Um, after our VBX 2 3 launches, I, I do not feel that this was an accurate report. There's no way that the balloon would have traveled to Wyoming. So um, I think this was an exaggeration from an eager observer, but nonetheless, <laughs> we did uh, put it in the in the article because that's all we knew at the time. Um, but um, but yeah, just a great little uh, great little write up here. One thing you'll find with any of the launches that we did, you know, I mentioned the first three folks that were involved, um, but there was, and I can't name everyone. Um, that's in, that was involved, but we probably had over the period of the four launches, we did probably 20 to 30 amateurs that played one role or another in ensuring the success of, of these launches. So this is definitely not, you know, one or two people that did this. This involved many amateurs from two provinces, businesses that donated and supported. And um, like I said, the last thing I want to do is, is not acknowledge everyone that was involved, but I, I, I feel I, miss, I may miss some, but um, again, just a wonderful uh, contribution that, that we had. So VBX2 came up. So right after uh, we did VBX1 at uh, Dale V6CPK and Tino V6SR, now known as V6MB, um, approached us and said, well, why don't you launch a balloon experiment and let's include GPS, let's include APRS. And we thought that was uh, quite a brilliant idea. And so Tino, Dale, Walter, V6ANI, Pat, um, just a, a bunch of folks in, uh, in Alberta, uh, Doug, V6CID, uh, donated GPS receiver at the time. And um, 
they took a, they took over the organizing and the and the uh, the construction of the APRS component for VBX two. So a year later, we launched VBX two. We estimated at the time it uh, hit an elevation or achieved an elevation of about 104,000 feet. And we did retrieve it about 70 kilometers away from the launch site. Here was an interesting note that James up in Edmonton sent out. We're up in Edmonton and V6 MK Barry in Sherwood Park. Just picked up the APRS beacon. We got a full position report. And at uh, 1354, Brian, the E6BCA is copying Vernon stations on 14652, approximately 512 kilometers away from Edmonton. So we knew at that point we had, uh, we had success and we were quite pleased with, um, with, our, uh, with our efforts. I do have to note here, like you could see here, there was no site you could go to on the internet and order a compact balloon transmitter package. Like I hear of these lightweight packages, these Pico balloons that are, you know, encompassing and circling the earth three, four, five, six times. We had nothing like that. Everything we did, we, we built ourselves. And you'll see some of the, um, the crude construction in, in future slides here. But again, this wasn't happening like you couldn't order a kit online so again with um with uh the donation of the gps receiver and at the time there was a ceiling of sixty thousand feet for gps receivers and yeah, we had no that. yeah we had no idea how a gps receiver when it exceeded sixty thousand feet and it was to come back down below sixty thousand feet would it reset? Would it reacquire? Would it send out valid data? So uh, Walter designed a circuit that would reset the GPS receiver about every 30 minutes. So it would do a, sh a complete shutdown and, and a restart. And um, so again, when we did hit that below that 60,000 feet, it would uh, reacquire uh, valid data. So what we basically did was we, we calculated the rise time because we knew the timing interval. We knew the rise time. Of course, when it became uh, below 60,000 feet, we knew the descend rate, the time intervals, and then we did the math and then we peaked it out to determine that we did achieve 104,000 feet at its, uh, at its peak. But of course, what goes up must come down. So in this case, um, the balloon descended and landed in a ridge about 6,000 feet north of Sugar Lake. And if you know the interior of BC at all, I know, Paul, I see you uh, watching there for 7KWA, you know this area quite well. So this package came down on a ridge about 6,000 feet above Sugar Lake. And the team from Calgary set out to retrieve this package. It was still working, it was still transmitting, but we had the added complexity. So we launched, we launched and then um, uh, two days later, we had the evacuation of, uh, of Salmon Arm taking place because of the uh, Fly Hills fire. So a number of the folks that were involved in Vernon were involved with manning the reception center in Vernon. So we can go out and retrieve it, so it was, Tino, Dale, Pat, uh, Walter, they set out on a, on a trek to, uh, to get the, uh, the package off, off the ridge. So we did, get, we did get this balloon back. We did get the, the styrofoam cooler back, but it took a little bit of work and effort. Um, but you can see, uh, see here, you know, beautiful hot day. We were inflating the balloons. And this is what we used as a counterweight. We, we determined that with, with VBX2, it was five, and a half pounds. So we used a roll of solder and a weight. We weighed it out to figure that the minute we would get enough lift off the balloons to see this rise, we knew we had enough to take the package up. So again, great article in, in the 1999 issue, or sorry, November of 98 issue with, uh, with VBX2. So we wanted to do something a little bit different. So we had, you know, added GPS to VBX2. We thought, well, why not add a slow scan TV transmitter to VBX3? 
And uh, Kenwood had just released what they call their visual communicator. And you can see, uh, see the camera here that's separated from the, from the main body. I'll show you in the next slide. But Kenwood just announced a slow scan TV transmitter. And what it would do basically, if you set it up in uh, an automatic mode, it would transmit a still image every three minutes. And it would take about just under 30 seconds to send this still image. And so when Ken would launch this, I was working at the dealer at the time and I went up to my now boss. So, well, how do these things work at 100,000 feet? He said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> we, we do this balloon launch where we're sending up beer coolers to you know 100,000 feet. And he said, well, I don't know. He goes, how about I give you two and you can experiment and you let me know how it works. So this was my first opportunity <laughs> to meet with, uh, yeah. meet with my boss. And yeah, we, we, we launched uh, the, the, this box and it sent uh, slow scan TV images back down, to, uh, back down to us. So here we're just putting the package uh, together. Uh, this is another gentleman, uh, some of you may know Dave, E7LTD, he is a creator of IRLP. He played a prominent role as well with our uh, balloon launches just at the time when uh, IRLP was at its, uh, at its infancy. So again, here we made it very clear on the box, you know, what it was uh, and some of the technical specifications on the box. We also included on the box uh, my phone number, contact information, which proved to be very beneficial. Here's another closer look at the, at the setup. Here again, we have the GPS receiver reset board. Um, it was also a Cantronics, I think KPC3 that was used as the, uh, the APRS transmitter. This was the uh, APRS transmitter that was used. It was uh, just a Kenwood VHF uh, portable. We had our visual uh, communicator that would send, uh, take the pictures. And we had a Yesu FT470 dual band portable. And what this dual band portable allowed us to do was it was also our cross band repeater. And you can tell now we were getting a little more brave because we we're launching equipment that was worth considerably more money, hoping to get it back. But we did have a successful uh, number two launch. So we were, we didn't want to get this equipment back. But what this uh, radio did, it performed a dual function. So it was a cross band repeater, but every three minutes, the cross band repeat um, operation would interrupt because then the slow scan transmitter would take over and send that 30 second signal. So this, this portable served uh, double duty or triple duty it was the UHF receiver, VHF transmitter for the voice. And then every three minutes, it was the transmitter for the uh, slow scan TV. Uh, here you can see the, the balloons I'm getting ready to lift the, the package into the atmosphere. And we got smart now. So this balloon, for example, was only maybe about eight feet above this one uh, point. We had another balloon about 20 or 30 feet above that. And then we had this balloon, I think it was about 60 feet uh, above that. So again, as the balloons expanded, we didn't want one to pop to bring the other two, uh, the other two down. And now we just have a short little video here that just sort of encapsulates uh, what this experience was, uh, was all about. So. See if it's coming there. So there we're just briefing, uh, getting the package ready. You can see that we had an active GPS receiver on the top, our D cell batteries that were lightweight. Again, all of our contact information and, and what really what the balloon was, that uh, was all about. We had our waste scale ready. And then of course, just uh, regular testing to make sure that the, that the package worked. Or inflating our uh, balloons. And what we did was we slightly over inflated two of the balloons and we under inflated the other one again to provide some, some uh, uh, lift uh, when it would come down. Again, here's our, uh, our fine detailed uh, technical work to connect it all up and to interface it to get it to work. Taking a closer look at the uh, GPS receiver and the, uh, the reset circuitry and uh, APRS transmitter, getting the balloons ready to go. And when we were doing this, we were actually doing this at what we refer to as Watson House. And at the time it was our tourism information center. So we had just a ton of folks out seeing what we were up to. It was a great way to showcase amateur radio to the community. Where's the trumpet? Five, four, three, two, one, go. 
Tina, you know, just a thumbs up if you can hear that, okay? That sounds good. And that's what the slow scan TV transmission sounded like. Information. You have to. That's awesome. So we're coming in. You didn't realize they were coming in direct through RBD. Like I said, I can turn all that off and it gets to be a nice thing. Is it Roger, uh... <laughs> Uh, you're actually sounding not too bad into Vernon here at all. Uh, we're probably in around 45 to 48,000 feet. So there we have it. And you can just imagine how much technology has changed in the last 25 years, right? With uh, when it comes to doing uh, doing this stuff. But we had a wonderful station set up at the time at our. Uh, uh, Space and Science Center, the, um, and we were able to uh, run all of our operations uh, related to this uh, to this balloon launch uh, from that uh, from that location. Uh, we uh, yeah, so obviously people want to see well what what were, what were the pictures like uh, that we received. So here are some of the still images that we received uh, from uh, from VBX. I think we figure this one it went up to about a hundred thousand feet as well. So in the upper image to the left, you can clearly see uh, the, our cadet camp, our military camp. Uh, then you've got the upper middle. You're sort of looking at the upper end of our uh, of what we refer to as Bella Vista and Okanagan Lake in the background. And then you can see as it gets up a little bit higher, a little bit more grainy. But you're looking at you know the the, the lower middle and the lower right. Uh, you can actually see the curvature of the Earth. And way back, you know, in 1999, when we were doing this, we thought this was something special, right? We were we were getting these these images. Uh, we were using the crossband repeater. You heard that one exchange with uh, with a gentleman in Vancouver when we only had really had achieved about 45,000 feet at the time. Uh, we figured, you know, we had obviously another 60,000 feet or so to go at that that point in time. So we were pretty pretty stoked about this. So anyway, so we've launched the balloon. Um, we're paying attention to it. I think Dave was actually talking to Tino and he said, okay, I've now lost the signal in Calgary. We don't hear it anymore. So we knew it was coming down. We were looking to retrieve uh, the package. We actually had a couple of, uh, of amateurs that came out of the trail area and they had a Cessna 172. So, you know, a few of us went up in a plane to see where, you know, can we find where, where this balloon was coming down? We had a crew that went out uh, from Vernon on land to see if they could track it down based on sort of the last known coordinates uh, that we had at the time. And so we're looking for this and we couldn't find the balloon. It was nowhere to be found from where we thought it had come down. And because you got to remember VBX2, we had a very clear position of where it came down north of Sugar Lake. The guys knew, you know, it was within, I think, a kilometer of an active logging road. So a little bit of bushwhacking to get it. But we went out close and we could not figure out why we could not find this balloon, even though we were very confident in the area that it went down on. But what we did not realize that there was a gentleman uh, that was uh, that found it. And we only realized when we, you know, we're driving around Kamloops, we we're going up top of mountaintops, trying to listen to the crossband repeater. But we had spent most of the afternoon outside of cell phone coverage. My cell phone rings. And uh, I was gentleman in his, and, um, and at this point in time, actually, we, had, we, had, we were in the midst of triangulating this signal in Kamloops. And we were getting ready to hone in. And all I could imagine was, did this come down on somebody's house? Did this come down on somebody's car? Did this come down on somebody's backyard? This five and a half pound box, you know, but my phone rings. And it says, hello. I said, hello. And he goes, hello, is this Wilfred? And I said, yes. And he goes, it's my Kamel. I'm calling from Kamloops. I have your package. And I'm like, excuse me? While well, he's flying around in his ultralight airplane outside of Campbell Lake, which is just south 
and east of Kamloops. And he sees this one balloon that was still inflated. And so he, he was recording this whole experience on his uh, camera in his ultralight plane. So he lands and he picks up this package and he puts it in his ultralight and he flies it back to Kamloops. I say this because we thought we were close to where this balloon came down, but we were in the area, we didn't hear anything. We didn't realize that somebody actually had picked up the package. And of course, the fact is all the contact information was on, on, the, on, the, on the cooler. Uh, he was able to, to call, but he had been calling all afternoon and we were out of cell phone coverage and he didn't leave a message. But anyway, we were quite, quite pleased to, uh, to be able to, uh, to get the package and like I said, quite a bit of a story there to, to get it back as well. So we didn't need to go into the wilds of the interior of BC. We had somebody in his ultralight airplane go pick this up for us. So it made for a very long day. You can see here, this is sort of the retrieval team in Kamloops at the Boston Pizza. And uh, again, this is sort of a shot the next day, you know, obviously we had the uh, the, the, <laughs> the remains of, uh, of the popped uh, balloon as well. And of course we were extremely happy uh, to uh, to be able to get the, uh, the package back. But another cool thing that happened at this time was again, you know, I mentioned Dave who had created IRLP and this is a write up Tino did. And I thought it was very fitting because we were really trying to do something different. We were experimenting with balloons, but Dave Cameron also did something different this weekend. You know, they had uh, about six nodes up and running for RLP and uh, Calgary actually was one of the first uh, cities to host one as well. First original connection was between Vernon and, uh, and Vancouver, but this is the day he tested the reflector uh, concept. And this is where you could tie all the nodes together. So Dave, what he was doing at the time was doing a live broadcast uh, through his IRLP network to all the other nodes that were connected on what we were doing in Vernon, uh, launching this uh, this balloon experiment. So I think, uh, you know, like I said, Tino sort of encapsulated this as well, but we used this fledgling uh, reflector network and used it as it was a media event sort of putting ABC, NBC, and CBS all to shame. So again, Tino, I did have to include this in here because it really spoke to sort of, you know, some of the cool stuff that we were doing and the various folks that were involved, um, sort of, I would feel on sort of the leading edge of, of some of the technology that was being developed. So again, just, uh, you know, another write-up that we did here uh, that just sort of spoke to, um, to uh, you know, the technology that we had in the package and uh, sort of the write-up. There's a lot of detail here. You know, we were using... Um, you know, um, uh, J-pole antennas at this point in time that were hanging from uh, from the balloon uh, package separated. Uh, but again, just how well it uh, how well it worked. But you have to think about this for a second. You know, line of sight, like what kind of coverage do you get with a balloon? So just to give you a comparison, so at, at a an antenna at fifty feet, you have to assume this is flat terrain. So you'll see some of these images. I'm referring to the interior of BC, but I think you'll know what I mean. So at 50 feet, you're looking at about 16 kilometer radio horizon. At 500 feet, you're looking at about a 50 kilometer uh, uh, distance, a radio horizon. So that's about the distance from Vernon to, to Salmon Arm. At 5,000 feet, you're looking at about 160 kilometer uh, radio horizon. So that's like Vernon to just outside of Nelson, Castlegar uh, area. But just imagine, right, when you're up to 100,000 feet, what does that look like? So at 100,000 feet, you have about a 750 kilometer radio horizon. So, you know, you're talking from, you know, you're launching a balloon uh, from the uh, southern interior here in the, in the Okanagan. You know, you're, you, you're, you have coverage, you're talking to folks, you know, up towards the Prince Rupert area, Bonneville, Edmonton, uh, Barhead, you know, out towards, um, um, you know, the edge of, uh, of Saskatchewan into Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. And we did make contacts um, throughout, uh, throughout this, uh, this uh, footprint. So imagine, right, what we could do at, at 100,000 feet. And just look at the footprint that you get from ISS when it goes over as well, right? It's, uh, it's pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal. But what sort of grew out of this was also, uh, you know, we had sort of worked with the folks up in uh, up in Edmonton, and some of you may have uh, had some familiarity or, or from, uh, have heard of Bear. But these were the balloon experiments that took place. A balloon experiment with amateur radio, Bear, and they uh, started these up in late uh, 2000. 
we even put a little Pooh Bear in their uh, their package. And, uh, you know, they were able to do some really cool things. Uh, what was uh, wonderful about their experiment out of Edmonton, the Discovery Channel actually featured um, what they had done up there. Um, very jealous, uh, envious, because this, of course, is, is launching a balloon, um, you know, in the Edmonton area where you can actually drive to where it comes down. I think one case, they actually had to go into... Uh, to a bit of a, a lake or whatever to retrieve it but you know obviously the the train there is much uh much friendlier to uh to deal with than than the interior of bc uh, i i don't have material here on on vbx4 we did a, a a fourth launch and a tino you were involved with this and they actually sent up a camcorder with with this but we learned with a camcorder that we didn't take into consideration the weight of the camcorder when we attached it uh, or mounted it inside the, the, the cooler. So what it did was it flopped down. So all that the camcorder recorded was the top of the clouds. We didn't see the curvature of the earth that we were looking for, but it started to come down and it went on its descend. We were looking at a very similar drop point as, uh, as VBX2, which was north of Sugar Lake but it actually came down just south of Rogers Pass. And so the folks that went to retrieve that package, you know, went up to Trout Lake, just north of Nacusp to get to the bottom side and to, to get that package. I think they blew a tire, busted a rim, you know, overnight in a SUV on, a, on the side of a mountain, but they did get that package back because the camcorder belonged to Michael's mother. And when she showed up to say, Michael, where's my camcorder? And he's like, it's in the package that we just about <laughs> let go. So anyway, there was a lot of motivated folks to, uh, to get that package back. But we didn't really do up a write-up on that one, but that was VBX4 that took place in 2000. Um, and that again, sort of concluded uh, what, we had, uh, what we had done at the time. So some great resources. Um, that uh, that we had in the Canadian Amateur that's really talked uh, to, in great detail about uh, about the launches and the experimenting we were doing. I do have to thank Tino. He was uh, he was my proofreader. I think for for a couple of the articles that we uh, that we submitted, but uh, it was just a real uh, real wonderful time, a real wonderful thing to to do. And um, obviously, you know, hearing um, what is happening now. Uh, with the military and and um, the um, the profile that this uh, this has uh, worldwide is uh, probably a very timely uh, timely topic. So so there you have it. Just a little bit about what we did about uh, twenty years ago in Vernon with uh, some fun balloon launches.